morning, everybody. And this morning, I have the privilege of speaking to Rachel Greer from Cascadia. Rachel, how are you doing? Hey, Ed. How are you? I'm doing great. Always um, great to speak to you. What I, I want to first of all compliment you on every time you're featured. I think you do a great job. And I know they, the Wall Street Journal, I think it was, which they did an important feature, which got a lot of press on the question if Amazon products from third-party sellers are sufficiently safe. So first of all, you want to talk a little bit about it and what makes you so qualified on this? Yeah. So um, I worked at Amazon for about eight years and more than half of that time, about five years, was spent working in Amazon product compliance. So working on um, recalls or product safety, um, working on restricted products, actually, so developing that program, um, and then working on compliance for Amazon's own brands and imports all over the world. So um, a lot a lot of different aspects of compliance. Um, and then since then, I've been advising sellers on how to be compliant, uh, making sure they understand what Amazon's looking for in terms of if they ask from product compliance, there's a question, or if they ask from product safety, is there a question? What are they looking for? Why are they looking for that? Um, and I think one of the things that's kind of funny that a lot of people don't realize is that there's a very big difference between Amazon's, um, it's the, I forget the exact thing that they call it, but the safety incident stuff, the team that does that is actually different than the team that does product safety. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's actually two completely different teams looking at this at Amazon, so it can make it even more confusing and difficult to handle. Right. So my, my you know, when I saw that, and I think other people had the same perspectives, um, the number you gave was that there was around 4,200 listings which were unsafe. And I think that came from the reporter who um, said that they didn't have warnings on over 4,200, something like that, because they, they looked at the balloon warnings, they looked at the age grading warnings, they looked at a couple different things, and then they also did a um, actual safety test, which I did a couple of years ago as well, actually two years ago now, um, just buying things off the site and sending it to a lab and seeing what's actually unsafe. So different different ways of looking at it, I guess, so lack of warning or just outright not being safe. <laughs> right. Well, I, I understand that. Also, you're a parent, I'm a parent, and of course, that's going to concern, even if you're not a parent, it's going to concern anybody if the items are not safe. But there's also like a little bit of different perspective. I, I know when, when you know, I'm from New York, and when the New York, like growing up, there used to be something between 2,000 and 2,500 homicides a year. Now, even if there's one, it's too much if you're that person. But then last, <laughs> <laughs> last year, <My> they, <laughs> right? But last year they do like a big celebration that they got it down to like 300, which was like the lowest in 100 years. And and it makes sense because you have so many people, you have 17 million people, and there's going to be some crime. And you, you try to do the best as you can, but it's not really realistic to get it down to zero. Now, I I do deal with Amazon, Walmart, um, eBay. And for me, to me, it seems like Amazon is the only one what's even giving it the college try of asking for documents, of asking for paperwork, of asking for testing. And they're, little, they're very erratic and <laughs> you can't, you know, their communication's horrible, I understand. But do you think it's possible that the journal was just picking on Amazon because the size was so large and that if they would do the same investigation to any Dollar Tree, they would come to the same conclusion. Actually, yeah, I think it would be very similar if you were comparing it to Dollar Tree or eBay or the Walmart third-party platform. They do have more checks on Walmart, but I don't think it's checks for safety. I think it's just checks for insurance. What the challenge is with Amazon is that it is the biggest in the marketplace, and it's not very clear for the user whether they're buying from Amazon or not. So a big difference um, with buying from Walmart.com versus Walmart, the store, is that the Walmart, the store purchases and Target, actually, all the other big box retailers, they actually have fairly good compliance programs where it doesn't even come in if it's not considered safe. So if you go in there and you buy a toy, there's no way that your baby's going to be able to break it and ingest magnets, which was the example given in the video. 
And that's, I think, the critical thing. So a lot of the people who are commenting on the video are like, you just shouldn't buy products with magnets in it, duh, like make sure you follow your kids around, you know? It's like, no, but the point is that mag formers use a particular plastic polymer that doesn't break. <laughs> right. So then the magnets don't ever come out. And I think that's what people weren't quite understanding is that when it comes to product development, the, the materials you, you use, how you put them together, the methodologies of production, all those have to do with whether or not it's safe. And so when you're thinking about something that's in an actual Walmart store, then they've already gotten that certificate, they've already gotten that testing, they've already reviewed it because the liability is so high for them. Whereas when you're buying from Amazon, people often don't know the difference between FBA and Amazon.com. And even Amazon.com doesn't check that much, but they don't know the difference either way. And so they're like, oh, fulfilled by Amazon, it must be okay. And then they buy it, not realizing that for this particular toy that says it's safe for kids, this one, the plastic will break and the magnets will come out. And I just don't think it's fair for parents to have to figure that out. I don't, I don't think that's fair. No, I, I agree that those, those are all excellent points. And I, it was impossible not to sympathize with the CEO of Mac Forms. I mean, he <laughs> put a Nobel Prize and he got blamed for something which he had nothing to do. So that was... That, that binder, did you see that, that, what was it, this thick, his binder of reports to Amazon? It was like, oh, I've seen things like this way too many times. Right, right, right. Now, a little bit also, do you think it's more the government's issue? These items are getting through customs. Yeah. And... I think that's a huge part of the problem. So when you compare the amount of funding that the government receives in, say, France or the UK or Germany, um, the number of people in the US who are in charge of product safety for like, like product safety in your home or for your kids or whatever, it's about 550 employees. That's it for the entire United States, all ports, all airports, all market surveillance, the support staff in their labs, the people who actually run the whole thing, 550 people. That's it. <laughs> And it's just crazy thinking how small that is, you know, compared to the size of the population here. In France, the size of the market surveillance team, just the market surveillance team, they just go into stores and buy stuff or go into Amazon and buy stuff and see if it's safe. It's over a thousand people just for them. So like the, the difference there is just, I mean, it's just hard to imagine how much different it could be if they were able to do their job. And I just don't think they can. So a lot of times, you know, when we would work with the CPSC, they would be like, hey, so can you guys look at this? Because they knew they couldn't. And when you know you can't, you know you can't do your job, you try to find other ways to kind of outsource it in a way, like hope that the, the retailers will, you know, try to work with Walmart, try to work with Amazon, try to work with Target, hope that they'll do it. And then they'll police the marketplace because you know you can't. I mean, there's, there's what, one investigator for the entire Western region? <laughs> What are they supposed to do? Right. Now, yeah, now Amazon can make the claim that we, we need to follow the laws. Right, um, and they do make that claim, yeah. Are they wrong? I, they're not wrong. The, the difference is for most people that I see who are trying to follow the rules, they're U.S.-based businesses with assets in the U.S., particularly houses or inventory or things that you can seize. So in a lawsuit, if you lose, they'll seize your stuff. <laughs> so I find that a lot of sellers in the U.S. who are who have something here are generally a lot more concerned about that, making sure that they have insurance in a lot of cases. Some people don't, especially when they're at the very beginning stages, but a lot more concern, shall we say, I, I've seen with U.S.-based businesses. The biggest problem that I see are non-U.S.-based businesses where there's no assets to seize. There's no reason to worry about it because there's nothing there's nothing to get them in trouble with. They're not based in the U.S. They can't be sued. There's nothing in the U.S. for anyone to seize. So you have these companies, and a lot of them are based in Shenzhen, China, unfortunately, who don't have any reason to care. And financially, they can't care, right? Because the whole point is just to ship out as much stuff as possible. I think there's um, an ignorance piece, which is, you know, I, I think there is definitely an ignorance piece, but I think that the willful disregard is more common with certain types of sellers. So, you know, I think that most people who are here are more concerned about this than people who are not. Right. I, I had the idea of if you're a U.S.-based seller and you're willing to put, like, a face to it and a picture and this is who I am and, and that I pay income taxes, you should be at a, a higher level seller within Amazon. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. I've actually been trying to see if anyone is listening what I'm saying, you know, there's some sort of uh, approach to 
grading sellers in a way. Okay, um, and so like so so you you agree that Amazon is not doing it. This is just the situation Amazon is in, and Amazon is not doing it because they're trying to. They don't care about safety. Yeah, I don't care. I don't think it's because they don't care about safety. In fact, I think that in general, Amazon cares quite a lot about safety. But the way that they're doing it with the the single ASIN whack-a-mole <laughs> approach <laughs> is, I think, really inefficient. So when I first was working on this back in 2011, we developed the restricted products tool, and the restricted products tool didn't look at the seller rating or who the seller was at all. It just looked at the ASIN because even some very good vendors were sending in items that shouldn't be sold online. They were just screwing everything up. Right. Uh, so like there wasn't any sort of sense of people understanding what they were doing. They were just putting things in that the FDA was upset about, that FTC didn't appreciate, like people just weren't paying attention. So we focused on the ASIN level. The problem when you focus on ASIN level is that you keep having new ASINs come in, right? So if a seller has an ASIN come down, then the most common response is to go and make a new one. At least that was the way it was for quite some time, especially with recall items, um, other items that are potentially unsafe. You just rework the words and start over, and, and maybe you don't want to because you've had some reviews, but that's the easiest way to get back up, right? So what happened was we would catch one thing, take it down, then uh, you know, like a week or two later, the sellers would make a new one, so you'd catch that when you put it down, and the next week there'd be more, and then you catch that one, and it was just like this constant, never-ending, this stream of crap. <laughs> wow. And so if you were to review the seller instead and to make the seller go through certain hoops, not like the pesticide case, that was a stupid quiz. I don't understand why they did that. That didn't make any sense at all. It was highly efficient. Um, but if you were to do something where there was, um, there's actually a precedent for this in, um, in the marketplace, it's actually an approach that is called ISO 9001 for factories. So with ISO 9001, there's a whole long list of things that they check for, that they audit for. Do you have tracking of this um, processing of raw materials? Do you have work and process inventory management? Do you track where your finished goods are? Do you test for this? Or do you keep your records in a particular place? Do you have SOPs? Do you have binders with final goods? Like the things that a factory would need to do to produce quality products. Well, you can have something exactly like that for sellers where you actually had, say, a seller audit where you could check and see, does this person keep track of their record keeping? Does this person um, review what customers say? Do they have you know, a customer service program in place where they can resolve customer disputes when they come in? Or whatever the case may be <clears throat> that is appropriate for sellers. Most of the time, these standards are made by an organization of the industry that it's in. So it would need to be some sort of seller organization that came up with this standard, but something like that. And then you have some sort of score. Third parties do this all the time where you get a passing score or you can provide your audit or your certification or whatever. And if you can get this, then it shows that you at least care about jumping through the hoops. <laughs> it doesn't show that you're perfect, but it shows that you try and you make an effort as opposed to not making an effort. <laughs> Do you think anything will happen in the next six months or not really? Um, it's hard for Amazon to do anything in that short of time because of how much time it takes to hire people and move quickly. And that, uh, six months is, um, is I, it depends. It depends on how much effort they put behind it. They were able to launch Prime Now in six months, but that is a significant profit driver. <laughs> Compliance is a cost center. So unless they were able to... Um, I don't know. I, I don't think very much will change in the next six months. My other suggestion was to make it more like the jewelry program, but jewelry has its own issues, but something where they're auditing, because what I've seen with jewelry is that the jewelry sellers are very concerned with making sure that everything is compliant. They make sure that everything is tested. They make sure that things are labeled. Like you don't, you don't mess around with your fine jewelry application because it costs 5k every time. So you're not going to mess around with that. So if something like that were for toys or for children's products or for things that had lithium ion batteries or things that had safety issues like helmets. Like, you know, if a helmet goes bad or a scuba diving mask goes bad, I mean, that's that's catastrophic, right? I mean, <laughs> you only get one body. <laughs> you know, it's important to like, protect it. So something like that is really important to be safe. So theoretically, they could make it to where, you know, each one of those required an application fee. Otherwise, you couldn't sell it. 
Um, I could see problems with that too, you know, because they try to do everything in such an automated way, like the pesticides thing was just s such a poor rollout, you know, and so I would just be concerned if they did something too quickly and then, you know, ran something out just to make it look good and then it was poorly ran like the pesticides. I mean, all you have to do to sell pesticides, which half of our client stuff that, you know, like all of the client stuff that was taken down were not actually pesticides. All that we had to do to sell it without making any edits at all was take this, this quiz, take 15 minutes, you know. Well, wow, everybody had the answers because it was the same. It was the same, same quiz for everybody, yeah. So, like, what's the point? That doesn't do anything. And right. I know that that was in response to the fact that there were lots of illegal pesticides on the website, things that were injuring people, things that were a big concern for U.S. regulators. And so Amazon rolls out a quiz. <laughs> yeah, <dude. laughs> um, okay, so one last question. I know it's Labor Day. We'll, we'll end it with this. Um, the, the feeling you got from from the article is that as a buyer, you know, sort of like buyer beware. You know, the average may, may not be. Now, I I've purchased I purchased around between I would say between five hundred and eight hundred, or maybe more orders a year on Amazon. In my, in my oh, business. yeah, <laughs> me too. <laughs> supplements and everything, you know, this, I still don't have hair, <laughs> but I'm still alive. And and um, do, do you think that as a buyer, um, there's a real concern that the items are not safe or it's just, uh, you know, just be careful? So I actually contributed to an article that was also part of the Wall Street Journal. They, they, they did um, two written pieces, a long form accompaniment to the video and then a shorter one. Um, advising consumers on what they could do. And basically, my thing is, I don't buy things for my son that are from no name brands. Um, as a growing child, he's much more susceptible to things than I am. So I just don't risk it with him. I only buy high end uh, supplements. If I'm going to buy him gummy vitamins, I only buy from the, <laughs> the ones that are willing to, to talk about their compliance program on their website. Then I'm like, okay, cool. Uh, you'll get my business because like, Obviously, there's nothing more important to me than my son's health. So for him, I will be very careful about it. For me, I'm like, I read the reviews. I see if anything's kind of weird. And if it's something for my face, then I read through everything if I can. If it's something for like skin or something I'm going to eat. If it's like clothes or household items, I'm not really that worried about it for me. When it comes to my son, I will buy the name brand stuff. I'll buy the more expensive stuff just because I'm much more careful We've worked with with clients before who just thought that people were applying things wrong. We had a client who was doing a makeup product and they just thought that people were applying the product wrong and we tested it for them. And it actually contained a very common type of bacteria in China's water supply. So it looks like their factory is using tap water to make the product instead of filtered, you know, purified water, which is unfortunate because that's gross. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you just you never know, especially when you're buying from you know, non-U.S. sources, because U.S. sources, they can be sued. That's why they're so careful. And I know a lot of people are like, they won't even talk to me. They won't even deal with me. It's like, yeah, because it's really easy to get sued. <laughs> they only want to work with people that, you know, they think they can grow with. But if you're going to source overseas, it's important to know what the voluntary standards are for your product as well. So for that particular one, that client didn't realize that there was actually an industry association that put a list of voluntary standards. They're like, here's what we recommend testing for. There was no regulatory standard. There was nothing that would have required them to do it coming in through customs. That's actually a misnomer in the U.S. People are like, oh, there's so many regulations. It's so bad for business. And it's like not for products, actually. It's actually really easy to bring in a lot of product. So for, for makeup, at least, there's hardly any regulations. So what we did was we tested to the voluntary standard, and that's where we found the bacteria in it. So the voluntary standard tests for heavy metals, so lead, cadmium, things that can cause... Um, in adults, they just cause behavioral disorders. So they cause um, unexplained rage and uh, depression. And like, you know, you wonder sometimes because there's a lot of adults who have these challenges and you're like, I wonder what you're eating. <laughs> but, uh, but that's for adults, at least it's much more manageable. Um, and then there's yeast that they test for and then they test for bacteria. There's like seven common types of bacteria that can contaminate these kind of things. So just like basic things like that, like if you're going to do anything that's topical or on the skin, you should just test for these. It costs like, I think, $180, maybe $200. And often people think that it's super expensive too. It's not, not unless you're doing electronics. If you're doing electronics, then yes, it's very expensive because the big labs have, they have like these giant machines. They're the only ones who have the machines so they can set the price. But for most products, most consumer products, it costs hardly anything to check for lead. And then a lot of it is just, you know, if you've got plastic, do a stress test. See if it breaks. 
in the video, they didn't show the mag formers, but the mag formers don't break. And the ones that the guy was doing, he was just like, and it broke and like that, you know? And mag formers will, like, you would have to really, like, take some pliers to it to make it break. And I think that's the thing that, you know, anyone who's developing a product should know what their product does. And I feel like that's a challenge for a lot of newbies in this space. They're just looking at the numbers and they aren't thinking about the end user. And I guess that, you know, I've done that for many years, thinking about how is a consumer going to screw this up and get mad at us? (laughs) And that's something a lot of people don't think about. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And I mean, it, it would be nice if Amazon was forced you to say where the, where the product is made. Yeah, that would be really helpful. You know, because um, one of the things that that Joanna, the the reporter who wrote the um, the piece about what consumers can do, um, she mentioned one of the things that's really, really common, and this is a really common thing with Chinese sellers for some reason, I'm not sure why, they'll do a comma and then no space after the comma. It's really common in titles and in bullets. And so you can see like, oh, this is a Chinese seller. Even if it didn't say made in China, that that comma no space is almost always someone who's writing from China. It's just maybe it's like a, a punctuation thing in their language, but it's it's really consistent. And then the other thing that she did was she saw that something was made in China. There were two toys that she was looking at and she saw they were made in China. So she wanted to follow up uh, based on what I'd said. And she asked them both for a children's product certificate. And one of them was able to provide the certificate within two days. And the other one never got back to her. So she bought the one that gave her the certificate. And it was like, oh, yay, you listened. <laughs> but, you know, most most suppliers should be able to give you one. And if they can't, then, you know, you need to do something about that, right? We have another client who got some stuff for, for children. They were asking their supplier, do you have certificates? And they're like, oh, of course, absolutely. And they sent it over and they were from 2011. <laughs> and we were like... There's no way that their supply chain is exactly the same as it was in 2011. You need new certificates. But things like that, you know, just just asking a supplier, you know, what do you do for compliance? As another client, we're like, you need to make sure this is compliant. So he asked and the supplier was like, oh, okay, you mean we need the special materials? (laughs) Like they all know how to do it. They all know how to be compliant. You just have to ask. Right. I mean, because Amazon, everything is price. So you try to make it cheaper. Yeah. Right. Okay. And that's that's what I think the biggest problem is why the Wall Street Journal kind of picked on Amazon is because the way that they've set up the search results, the way that they've set up the system is it rewards people for cheaping out. And I think that's the problem. If you had some sort of process for auditing or some sort of process for review beforehand, some sort of way for consumers to know what they were buying, because, you know, some people are perfectly fine with cheap and crappy. Cool. Like, but you should know that's what you're getting rather than believing that it's safe. And great price, right? That that I think is the challenge. Yeah. Okay, Rachel, that was really informative. Thank you very much. And like always, it's great speaking to you. Thank you so much. You too, Ed. Take care. Have a great Labor Day.